I'm going to go. Good morning, everybody. I'm really glad you're here this morning to listen to the screenwriting seminar. Um, we're going to really try and focus on story structure today. Uh, I kind of feel like that's one of the things that when you're starting out uh, can be the most confusing because you'll sit down to write a script, you'll have a great idea, um, but you don't quite know how to make it a story. Mary Jo was actually mentioning having a lot of ideas earlier. Um, and uh, one of my favorite influences in screenwriting, Robert McKee, always used to tell a story that a man would come up to him and he'd say, I've got a great story for a great, a great story for a screenplay. And he says, okay, well, you know, tell me your story. He's heard probably thousands of these things. The guy says, so did you know that uh, if the moon were to shift its axis just about a quarter of an inch, that that would mean the end of life on Earth? It would be completely different. He said, no, I didn't know that. What's the, what's the story? What's the movie? He said, well, well, that's it. He said, no, right? That, that's a concept. Um, that's an idea, and you need to be able to apply structure, and you need to be able to create convincing characters. You need to do so many things in order to bring an idea into a screenplay, into a film um, that eventually gets produced. And so I want to kind of focus on that structure piece today. Um, but I will talk about format to begin just a little bit. Um, and before I get into that, I just want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Joshua Carlin, for those of you that don't know me. Um, I'm a recent transplant from LA. I got here in June. Uh, I run Turn Film Co. here in Olympia. Uh, we are an active production company. We specialize in narrative film work. Um, so we make story films, uh, both shorts and hopefully soon features. Uh, that is my email. Uh, I don't think we'll have a lot of time for questions today because, like I said, I've kind of packed it full. Um, so if you have questions or if you just want to reach out, um, feel free to contact me there. And you can snap a picture, take a note or whatever. It'll also be on again at the end of, uh, at the end of my lecture here so that you don't have to do it all right now. Um, I'm a husband and a father. I married my beautiful wife almost 10 years ago now. Um, obviously, I'm a great dancer also. Um, I was out on a daddy-daughter date with my seven-year-old Lillette there, and she said I needed a tie. As you can tell, I'm a very casual person. I'm not really someone to wear ties a lot, but I went ahead and threw on the tie for her. And below that is my five-and-a-half-month-old daughter, Leah. Um, she is the new thing keeping us up at night. Um, but she started to sleep a little bit more, so we think we're going to keep her. Uh, I am also a filmmaker. I've been uh, working in film for over 20 years now. Uh, I started out, the very first things I was doing was acting. Um, I still act today, but not, not nearly as much. Um, I have shifted more into directing and actually here producing as well. And uh, of course, I'm a screenwriter, um, which is why I'm here talking to you today. I've been screenwriting for about 15 years. Uh, I had my first paid job about 10 years ago, been optioned a few times, um, have a couple of things that are uh, hopefully going to be in production someday that we might actually see, um, and things that we're producing here that we, we definitely can see. Um, so before I go into story, for, uh, story st structure and things, I know that some people are here because uh, they want to know how to get their story on the page, and they think they've already got that part together, or maybe they do. And so I want to spend a moment talking about formatting. And to do that, um, we're going to use Final Draft. That's the software that I use. Um, it's the industry standard. 95% of productions in Hollywood are uh, built from a script that was, that was written on Final Draft. Um, it's an amazing software. It can do everything you'll need it to as an amateur and everything you need it to as a pro, um, from live collaboration, uh, you can break down scripts. You, you can do anything that you need to do with Final Draft. The problem is Final Draft costs about $250. Um, and I don't know about you, but when I was starting out, that was a prohibitive cost. Um, and there shouldn't be those kind of barriers to entry for creatives in my mind, so there are other options. Um, the only one on this list that I've used myself is Celtics. Um, it does not do everything Final Draft does, but it does allow you to write a script, pull the story out of your head, put it on the page, and you, you'll have a screenplay that is in the correct format that you can share with industry professionals, and it will look good. Um, it's free forever, so uh, it's also well known. I think a lot of people that um, become professional start out using Celtics, but these days there's a lot more options as well. Um, and so the couple here in the middle, Fade In and Writer Duet, those are ones that I know a lot of uh, currently writing people are using. Um, the downside with those is they do also have a cost eventually. Um, fade In, you could potentially use it for free forever because you would use um, one script at a time. When you finish your script, you save it to a PDF, close it out, and you can then start a new script. Um, you can't then go back and you know, restart that one. But when you're done with it, you can do one at a time. Um, so that's nice about Fade In because Writer Duet, um, which is, which is pretty, pretty great too. Um, both of these can export in Final Draft format, so you can share with other people who might use that. 
Um, and they also allow collaboration and things um, like Final Draft does. But Writer Duet is only going to allow you first three scripts for free, and then it's a monthly subscription service. Um, it's less upfront than Final Draft, but it is a monthly recurring charge, kind of like Adobe is, right? Um, but less. And then Trellby, um, that's another one. I actually, I don't know many people that use it, but I do know that it's out there and that people like it um, because it's totally free, like Celtics always. Um, the reason I always shied away from it is because it's open source. Um, and that means it's kind of like Wikipedia in that anybody can at any time edit the source code. They can add things, they can remove things. Um, and so from what I understand, it's a pretty stable software, but that's a possibility. And so I just want to let you know that. Um, so. I want to take a minute here and look at Final Draft. This is what it looks like when you open up your page. It's a regular old word processor, right? Um, the difference is if I try to press Enter in Final Draft, it doesn't skip me down the next page. It shows me um, what my elements are, my screenwriting elements. Okay? And whenever you start a script, it's always going to start with scene heading. Um, Final Draft is very smart, so it knows what you're going to do next. It knows what you should do next. Um, and sometimes you'll have to do what I just did and press enter for a second time to pull up this list so you can jump over to transition, for, for instance. But for the most part, you can write and use tab and enter to get through an entire script. Um, so the reason it starts with a scene heading is because that's the first thing you need whenever you're writing a scene. Um, and a scene heading has three elements. It's going to be whether that scene is happening inside or outside or a combination of both, an IE or an interior exterior scene. Um, then it's going to have the location, and lastly, the time of day. So just for our illustration purposes, we are inside. So uh, if I just had started with a letter and I started with an I, it would have immediately come up with interior or interior extra. And I can then press tab, and that'll take me to my next element. My next element is where we are. So we're here in Studio B, I think is what I was told. And then I push tab again, and it's... Studio A. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rob. I'm in <laughs> Studio A. Studio A. So let's fix that. Like I said, it's smart. I don't have to worry about capitalizing or anything else that's going to do all that for me. I push tab again, and it's going to ask me, well, what time of day is this happening? That's important, um, both because it can set tone in a script. Um, and whenever you're sharing your scripts with people, you want to get as much information as you can in a little bit of space, right? Because uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but I'll, I'll mention it now. So we're going to say it's the afternoon here. And all I have to do is push A, and I push tab again, and it's moved me on to my next section. Um, it knows what my next section is. My next section is an action section. So if I push Enter here, it's going to show me, yep, I'm in the action section. Right? Um, and the action section is where we tell what's happening in the scene. Um, if you write a lot of dialogue, you've probably written a play. Um, plays focus on dialogue to move the story forward. Films focus on action and visuals. And so a film is written in the action segments. Obviously, there's dialogue. Right? But the action section is where you're going to find most of your meat of a, of a screenplay. So for instance, um, we're here in Studio A and Joshua, that's me, the first time you enter a character into a script, you're going to capitalize it. Um, and guys, I know I'm running this very fast. It's a lot. Um, I know they're going to have it back for replay. And again, questions and things, just email me. I'm more than happy to, to get back with you. But I do have to rush. So um, you're going to capitalize your name or any name the first time you see it in a script. Um, what that helps with is when we're breaking down a script, we're going to go through and look, okay, we've got this many characters. Um, and that's something that helps the production team, right? Um, you do have to actually capitalize it the first time yourself. This final draft won't do that for you. Um, but afterwards, you're good to go. So Joshua is delivering a fantastic lecture on screenwriting to a captivated audience. Right? Um, so that's my action line. From here, uh, Final Draft is going to assume, if I press Enter, that I want to write more action. right? Because each action line is actually a, its own idea. You don't want to write these long action paragraphs. White space um, is something you'll start hearing if you're writing and, give, and submitting things for production or for review and coverage. People are going to tell you, you don't have enough white space. Right? And what that means is as you're looking at the page, you want to see lots of white space. What that tells them is that you have a well-paced script that you haven't spent too much time in description. You're not writing a novel. You're not writing a play. You're writing a film. Um, this time, we're not going to have more action, because this is the only thing I want to talk about right now. So instead, I'm going to tab over. Tab is going to take you to the next most likely element. If I wasn't sure what that was, or I knew what I wanted to do, and I didn't know what tab was going to do, I could still press Enter again, and I can choose for myself. So what I want to do is skip over to character. 
right? And the character who's talking is me, right? And um, from here, I can press enter or tab, and it's going to take me to my next element. Um, actually, if I press tab, it's going to take me to my next possible element, which is a parenthetical. Um, a parenthetical is going to give instructions to the, uh, to the reader, um, whether that be a director or an actor or a producer. And you want to be really careful about giving instructions to producers and actors and directors. They don't want them. They don't need your input. It's what they would think. So the only time you really want to use a parenthetical is whenever you can't clearly get across what you're trying to say from the dialogue itself. Um, you know, you could also say whispering if you really think it's important, things like that. Um, here, it's just normal, so we're not going to do that. And we're just going to go to a line. This is the line. All right, and that's where my dialogue goes. I have, so far I've gone through my uh, scene heading, my action, my character, my parenthetical, my dialogue. And there's only two more that we're going to go through, um, shot and transition. Shot is another one of those that you're not going to use um, if you're writing a spec script. Because spec is something where you don't get to choose what's going to happen with the camera. The director does that, right? Um, they and the DP are going to work together on that. Um, if you write in camera shot, so let's show you what that looks like. Um, if I go to shot, Camera one pans from audience to speaker. But the camera didn't move, right? The camera's staying right there. The reason is I'm a screenwriter and I don't get to tell the production company what they're going to do with the camera, right? Now, if I'm a writer director, if I'm Quentin Tarantino or I'm Christopher Nolan or Robert Rodriguez, then I can write whatever the hell I want because I'm going to direct it myself. I'm going to make those choices, right? And so that's when you'll tend to see um, those kind of camera directions in a script. If you're looking online and you're reading through scripts, um, which are widely available and I highly recommend you do if you want to be a screenwriter. Um, you'll see things like that if it's a production script or if it's a writer-director script. Otherwise, you won't see shots, or at least you typically shouldn't. Um, the only time you want to include it if you're writing spec is if you think this is really important, it's going to get the idea across. You know, I want to be looking up, these people need to look really powerful in the screen, and, and I don't know how to say that in fewer words than give it a shot. I wouldn't do it myself usually. But on occasion, you do. Rules are made to be broken. As they say, you just need to know the rules and kind of respect where they're coming from first. Um, so then the last thing uh, is a transition. And a transition is something that gets you from one scene to the next or from beginning to, or from, a, from a story to the end. And, and typically, you're not going to see a lot of transitions in a script because we're not going to often say, cut to the next scene. We just do. There's that assumption. Right? Um, but you might see something like a smash cut or a match cut. Um, and if you're not sure what those are, I'm going to skip it for now. But basically, you're kind of staying in the same spot and you're moving time. Um, and when you do things like that, uh, and it's impactful to the story, you might want to clarify with a transition. But the most common use of transition is to say, fade to black. I've ended my script. Right? You might have a fade in, something like that. Um, and so that's how you're going to use transitions. And I know that was super fast. Uh, I will add one more thing that um, you'll see general listed in that, in that list when you break it out. There's other things too, but you're probably not going to get confused and think you need to use them because they're about outlines and production. Um, but general is right up there at the top. That's really never used. If you're using general, it's because you've decided to use Final Draft as a regular word processor, and you probably don't want to do that. Um, or if you do, go crazy, use general. But it's not used in scripts. Um, it's defined in the negative in the sense that anything that doesn't fit in these other categories, you would write in general. But there is nothing that you use that fits in those other categories. All right. So um, moving on, and I'll have these little pretty scenes of the Hollywood sign a few different times throughout. Um, that's when I'm changing sections. Uh, this is actually a picture of the Hollywood sign from the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. Um, I didn't take it. It's just a really nice picture. Uh, I had my mother paint me a watercolor of it um, that I hang in my office. Uh, and I just love this photo, so I thought I'd share it. Um, the Griffith Observatory was one of the last places we visited when we left LA. Um, if you're ever out there, I highly recommend it. It's free and it's amazing. All right. So I'm going to talk about influences. Um, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, as they say, um, and everyone who talks about story is standing on Aristotle's shoulders. Um, he talked about story. He was the first person to really um, make a treatise on story. And he described stories in terms of plot, character, theme, dialogue, music, and spectacle. Um, I'm going to really have to rush through this section, so I'm only going to kind of talk about a little bit. Um, again, this will be available. Um, if you want to email me, you want my PowerPoint, I can share it. Uh, but music is something I think is interesting that's included here by Aristotle. And he's not necessarily talking about a soundtrack, right? Um, if there was live theater, there might have been some music. But what he's talking about is the pace of speech 
and the sound of the dialogue, the way that um, you deliver a line, right? The melody of speech, as he would say. Um, he also talks about the importance of visual storytelling, even so far back. Um, and he definitely agreed with the idea that there should be a strong structure, um, arguing that plot should be, uh, should, should arch over a central, uh, a central action or a central element. Um, and also was a big fan of theme and what the story means. All of our writers are all going to build off of this. Um, and it doesn't really change a lot. Um, and in order to kind of catch up on some time, I'm going to kind of skip through here. Um, I'll talk about Campbell and then I'll, then I'll skip through. So um, Joseph Campbell uh, came up with the idea of the monomyth or the hero's journey. He said that all stories are basically the same in terms of their structure. Someone leaves the ordinary world, they go out, and they are changed and transformed by conflict and obstacles that occur in the second act or in the area out there. He didn't call it acts. And then you come back and you bring with you a boon for society or new knowledge gained through, using, uh, through overcoming these trials that you went through. All right. Um, so departure, initiation, return is what he called it. And Sidfield called it Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3. Um, Sidfield is credited as bringing the three-act structure to screenwriting. He didn't come up with the three-act structure, but he did bring it to the art of screenwriting, and he's the first person to really talk about screenwriting in that way. Everyone else that follows is going to continue that. Lajos Egri. Egri. Um, I include him here even though his, his book here is actually about playwriting. Um, but what I drew from it, and what I think is really important, um, this was recommended by Seth Rogen actually, which is why I picked it up, um, is the idea of the power of the premise. Um, he's talking about theme here, right? Uh, your story needs to be about something. A good story is about something. And um, Lagri said, uh, Egri said that you can create your theme and your premise in, in, in three words, basically. And it should be a thumbnail synopsis of your entire story. And that thumbnail synopsis should include character, conflict, and resolution. And it seems like kind of a, a big ask. But when you break it down, something like honesty defeats duplicity. Honesty is, is encapsulating character, right? That's an honest person, right? or group of people, or an honest idea, or whatever the case may be. And it defeats, there's conflict there, right? And so you're talking about the way that we're going to get through the story. And in, and in this particular theme, honesty defeats duplicity, right? That doesn't make it a universal truth, right? We're going to argue that throughout the entire story, duplicity being, um, defeating duplicity being the resolution, right? Um, and we're going to argue that throughout the story. And we're going to come to an, uh, uh, we're going to come to an agreement about what the answer is. At the, end of that, uh, at the end of that movie or story or, or, or script. Um, but it doesn't mean it's a universal truth because we could also honor that, or argue that duplicity can defeat honesty, right? Um, that frugality leads to waste. We could also argue that frugality leads to opulence, right? There's, there's different um, ways to approach theme, and the one that you're arguing for in your script is going to be your premise. Robert McKee, um, he's one of my favorites. Uh, he's been around for over 40 years. Uh, he wrote this book about 25 years ago. And uh, he, <clears throat> he actually is extremely famous in Hollywood and in screenwriting circles. He's considered a script doctor to major studios on tons of films. Um, Robert McKee kind of distilled the art of Hollywood screenplays. Um, and he did it in the same way that Aristotle did and everyone before him, he talks about the need for multidimensional characters, um, characters that have strengths and weaknesses that are both relatable and interesting, and that you have to take those characters and you have to put them through an intense conflict. And that conflict and the characters and the dialogue and that they all, all of this needs to be wrapped around a central premise, a theme that is going to permeate the entire story. And then whenever he gets through his conflict, he's going to come out on the other end totally transformed. And his world is going to be transformed because of him. The hero creates the transformation. He has to be active. He has to be active throughout, and he has to create the change that you see in the story. Um, he goes through this in a much more um, intricate way than someone like Sid Field did. Sid Field's book is probably about that thick. Robert McKee is about that thick. Um, he also has been doing a, um, a seminar, a live seminar for 40 years on uh, story that he recently stopped doing. He did his last one in LA last year. 
Um, however, he this year at least offered a uh, virtual version. Um, it's live. Uh, it was live. It just finished. I actually attended it. It was phenomenal. Um, 30 hours of listening to one of the best talk about the art and the craft. Um, I also think it's interesting to note here that he, he, brought, he brings up genre, which is something that wasn't really talked about uh, as much by the previous guys. Um, he talks about the fact that genres have their own conventions and expectations. Um, and if you exclude those expectations, you do it at your own peril. Um, it's kind of one of those things, again, rules are made to be broken, but you need to know why you're doing it and it needs to be purposeful. Otherwise, you're just kind of cheating your audience, is what he would say. And the uh, next person on this list, the first lady on the list, um, screenwriting is certainly male dominated, so is the industry in, in, uh, in whole, and so I wanted to include a lady that was uh, influential for me, and Linda Seeger is that person. Uh, she wrote both Making a Good Script Great and characters, uh, creating unforgettable characters. If I had to pick between the two, which I don't know why you would, but if you had to, um, I, would, I would read Unforgettable Characters. The reason being that um, she really dives into that aspect more than the others do. Um, except McKee has a book called Character where he does as well, but um, he's more known for story. Uh, and she brings up a lot of, uh, of a talk about subtext and about emotional relevance, um, emotional resonance, I'm sorry. Um, and she talks about the fact that with subtext that what you don't say is often more important than what you actually do say. Um, Linda Seeger is a genius, uh, read her books. The last person I'm going to talk about today, and I'm going to use this structure to complete the lecture and talk about um, story structure, is Blake Snyder. Um, I'm sure that some of you if, you, if you're in the world of screenwriting, you've heard of Save the Cat. Um, Save the Cat is just a way of saying create a likable protagonist. If you have a character walking down the street and there's a cat stuck in a tree, and he stops and figures out a way to save that cat, then you know something about that character. And you probably like that character, unless you hate cats, right? Um, and so it's, it's very uh, simplistic, and much of what Blake Snyder writes is very simplistic. That would be the argument against him. Um, but what I think is very valuable um, in something, especially for a beginner, uh, with uh, with Blake Snyder is that he, not only does he believe in clear and concise storytelling, but he, he breaks down the process clearly and concisely. And he puts in points for you to, uh, to meet as you go through. And so what I use this for, um, I use it in outlining. Um, whenever I'm coming up with a story, I, I, I do everything I think I need to, and then I go back and I check his beat sheet, and I see if I'm missing something. And if I am, I better have a good reason for it, right? Um, again, rules made to be broken. but. Uh, most of the time, if I'm missing something, it's a problem, and I need to find it, and I need to fix it. Um, he also talked about genre conventions. Um, again, he was, he was much more defined and concise, and he says you know, that this genre has to include these things. Um, when he goes through his beat sheet, he's going to say it has to be on page 75 in a 110-page script. If it's longer, you can move around. But, but I think that's a bit much. Um, I think most people would think that's a bit much, and some people kind of toss them aside because of that. But um, it, if you're not on page 75 and you're on page 90 in 110 page script, then you probably do have a problem, right? Um, you're, you're waiting too long to get to at page 75. I think that's the all is lost moment. Um, and so you, need, you, you don't need to be exact, in my opinion. Uh, in Snyder's, you do. But uh, you do need to understand why it's important to happen around that time in the story so that if you're not doing it, you have a good reason. Um, and talking just a little bit about genre conventions, we'll look at one of them. So he has 10. Um, a monster in the house. This is what a lot of horror movies are. Um, and the first thing I'm going to talk about is Jaws. So we'll use that as an example. Um, Jaws is the monster, obviously. The house is the ocean. Seems like kind of a big house, but you're confined, right? This, the shark can't go out and eat you on the shore. So if you just stayed on the shore, you'd be fine. But these idiots, they don't stay on the shore, right? They jump in a boat and they go out there and then they and they tackle with the guy. So, um, tangle with the guy. So um, there's you you have to meet certain criteria in order to be a certain kind of film. And in horror, we always talk about they do dumb things. Well, that's kind of an important. That's kind of part of it, right? Um, because they can't just you can't just be stumbled upon. You have to be active, including being active and being stupid. Right? So. Um, now we're going to get into the heart of it, and we've got about 30 minutes left, so I haven't done too terrible in, in being too verbose. It goes with writing, but um, we're going to break out Blake Snyder's beat sheets. He has 15 beats. Um, he says that they happen on distinct portions, and that they do certain things for your story. And the first one 
is going to set the tone of the story. It's going to tell you the type of story that you're in. It's going to tell you something about the style of the film and the filmmaker. Um, it's a starting point for the hero. It's a before snapshot of the world. It has an opposing point that's called the final image. Um, and this opening image, any guesses? It's what I was just talking about. It's Jaws. Right? I think a lot of people confuse opening images with opening sequences. And, in, and when you think about Jaws, I think a lot of people, they think about that party on the beach. The, uh, the lady, she strips off her clothes, she jumps into the ocean, she swims out and gets eaten by the shark. Right? That is the opening sequence. It's, the set, it's part of the setup. It's the inciting incident. But it's not the opening image. The opening image is actually of this unseen predator point of view swimming through the depths of the ocean with that theme of da-da, da-da. Dana, 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 going on. And it really sets, like I said, it sets the tone. It tells you the stakes. This thing is deadly, right? Um, it tells you a little bit about the style. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to see a lot of the shark through the entire film. You really only see the shark for about 30 seconds of the entire film. And it may not seem that way in your head, but that's what happened. Um, and I don't have time for the aside. There's, there's, a, there's a shark in Martha's Vineyard that they use that's still there. And it's really cool. You can go see it someday. Um, but the opening image of Jaws is under the water the f with the shark, and the final image of Jaws is of Hooper and uh, Brody, and they have killed the shark, and they are swimming back to shore, kicking back to shore with two little buoys and pieces of their broken boat um, on top of the water without the shark. So it's this opposing image. Um, and I want to kind of preface here for just a second. I'm probably going to ruin a movie for somebody as we go through this. Um, I'm going through 15 different films, and I'm just gonna kind of breeze through real quickly what happened um, in those moments. So if I, if I spoiler you, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. All right, Jaws um, was written by Peter Benchley. The book was written by him. He also contributed on the screenplay with Carl Gottlieb and it was directed by Steven Spielberg. Theme stated, um, this needs to happen on page five, according to Blake Snyder in a 110 page script. Um, and in the first five minutes he says, someone, usually not the main character, is going to make a statement or pose a question that is the theme of the story. Um, you know, pride, go before the fall, be careful what you wish for, right? But it's not going to be quite so obvious. It's going to be more conversational. Um, it's something that the main character is not quite going to get yet, right? Um, and like we said before, a good movie is about something, and this is where you tell your audience what it's about. Um, this still is from When Harry Met Sally, um, one of my favorite rom-coms. Um, and Harry leans over and tells her, of course, you know, we're not going to be friends, right? And Meg Ryan, in this case, being the main character who doesn't quite understand that yet. Um, and then we're going to spend the entire movie debating that question. Everything in the movie is about that question. Can you be just friends or is the sex always going to get in the way, like Billy Crystal posits, right? Um, Harry Met Sally was a screenplay by Nora Ephron and directed by Rob Reiner. Next thing we're going to talk about is setup. Um, this happens in the first 10 pages, and you do a lot here. You need to actively set up the hero, the stakes, and the goal. You're going to introduce every character in the A story. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about A and B stories today. There's also C and so on and so forth, but we're only going to talk about A and B today. A is what you would call the external story. It's the story that drives the plot of the movie. Right? And we're going to meet all of the characters in the A story in the first 10 pages, according to Snyder. That doesn't always happen, but... Usually it does. Um, we're also going to uh, introduce usually some character ticks that are either going to need to be changed to solve the problem or are going to perhaps foreshadow something that, uh, that later on is going to become useful um, because of this character, even though right now it may not seem useful. Um, we're also going to show why the hero needs to change in order to win. We're going to know that there's some fault here that needs to be addressed or this person won't be successful. Uh, it's the setup. It's the world before the adventure starts. And whenever we get to the next section, which is called the catalyst, that's when the world is going to change. But um, this is a scene from the opening of Die Hard. Uh, the opening image is actually the plane landing. But on it is uh, Bruce Willis and uh, John McClane. And he uh, is not happy to be in LA. He is carrying a gun, which we find out means he's a cop. Uh, he's on the verge of getting divorced. You'll often find people on the verge of something in the setup. Uh, we know that because he tells Argyle, his, his friendly limo driver, and because his wife, he finds out, is using her maiden name on, uh, on, on, uh, at the business. Uh, we also find out that they have kids, which raises our stakes, right? Um, and we know that because Holly has a picture of them on her desk and because she calls home and asks about them. 
Um, and we know that this marriage is even in further trouble because they're having a big argument about her using her maiden name, right? But then on page, I think it's page 14, about 14 minutes into the script, we find out this isn't about marriage drama. This is about something else because a mystery van arrives, right? But in those first 14 pages, and Die Hard is a little longer than um, an hour and 50 minutes, so it's okay for it to stretch a little bit, Blake would say. Um, we find out everything we need to know to get this story going. Um, and it's very important. The first 10 pages are often the only 10 pages you're gonna get in front of someone if you don't wow them. And so um, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the most critical portions of your play, or your, your screenplay. Die Hard was written by Jeb Stewart and Stephen E. D'Souza. It's directed by John McTiernan. Now we talked briefly about the catalyst. This is the moment where everything changes, where that first uh, setup is, is thrown on its head. Um, in uh, Die Hard, it's when that van shows up and they pop out with machine guns. And in Rain Man, Tom Cruise gets the call that his father's died, right? Uh, Reese Witherspoon in Legally Blonde, her fiance breaks up with her, right? This is what is going to set our story off. It's usually called the inciting incident um, by most writers, but Snyder calls it the catalyst. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, briefly Saving Private Ryan because in this moment, Captain Miller has just finished storming Normandy and uh, I think there were 35 casualties twice, or deaths twice as many casualties as what he's just told this guy. And he said, well, you know, we had you do it because you're the best. And I've got another one for you. It's a diplomatic mission. We need you to go save this kid. All of his brothers have died. We think he's somewhere over in this place. And uh, that's, that's what sets off the story here. He has to go save Private Ryan. This one was written by Robert Rodat and directed by Steven Spielberg again. We'll probably see a little few more of those. I like Steven Spielberg. Um, debate. So after you get this information, you have to have a period of time where your main character goes, this is crazy, right? This is, this is not a good idea. Um, can I do, dare I? It's dangerous, you know? Um, they have to realize that. And then they also have to make a decision. Um, what's the choice, right? Do I stay here? Um, and if they did, there wouldn't be a movie, so they don't, right? But the debate has to happen. We have to see that as an audience. Otherwise, we just think, if it was that easy, then, you know, why, why are we watching this, right? Uh, and so in Legally Blonde here, we have Elle, played by Reese Witherspoon. Uh, she's just been broken up with, and she's decided, I'm going to Harvard Law. And she walks into her counselor's office, and this is her reaction when her counselor tells her, well, they're not going to be impressed that you aced the uh, history of polka dots. Right? She was a fashion major. Um, and she decides that she's going to take the LSAT. She's going to study for them. She's going to skip Greek week. Um, she's going to eventually create a lascivious admissions video uh, filmed by one of, the, uh, uh, one of the Coppolas, is what she says. And uh, she actually does get approved by an all-male admissions staff at Harvard. Right? So her ploy worked out. She, she, she uh, kind of went back and forth about, well, could she, would she? And then she did. And when they do, um, we reach one of the most important movies in a film, or moments in a film. Uh, oh, sorry, forgot to mention, it's written by uh, Amanda Brown, Karen McCullough, and Kristen Smith, and directed by Robert Lukatic. The most, one of the most important uh, moments is Break into Two. This is where um, your old world that you've created is going to change into a brand new world, the antithesis of that original world. Um, Snyder would say the setup is the thesis, and act two is the antithesis, that you've turned that world upside down. You're going to meet characters that are entirely different than you had in the first act, and you're going to have to make that step into the world actively. Your character has to decide and actively move into act two. I actually turn, I, I, I call these turns. Um, it's where I got the name for my film company, um, Turn Film Co. I, I, I've always called them a turn into two, a turn into three. I'm sure I read that in one of my many books, but I don't remember which one, so I can't credit it right now. But um, Snyder calls them a break into two, right? You're going to take your character, throw them against the wall, and they're going to have to break away and go off in a new direction. It has to be that active. And uh, here in um, Alien, we see the character played by John Hurts. He is leaning over an alien egg, and surprise, an alien japs up and globs onto his helmet, right? Um, we learn a couple of things there. One, don't stick your head over alien eggs. And two, 
we're going to have an argument about this, right? It's going to actively be a move into two because Sigourney and Ian are back at the ship and they're, they're, they're debating whether or not he can get on, whether or not they should quarantine him outside of the ship. And ultimately, the decision is made. The decision, not, not, it didn't just happen. It wasn't just like, oh, it slipped in. They make the decision to let him and the alien back on the ship. Uh, and from there, you have a whole new world. Now you have a monster in the house. You have an alien on a ship, right? Uh, another good one I like to mention here that I, I, I avoided Star Wars, but I talk about it a couple of times. Um, Luke's parents get killed, right? That's what catalyzes the, uh, the move against the, against the Empire, right? But that's not the break into two. The break into, he, he didn't just, you know, fall asleep and end up on the Millennium Falcon. He had to make the choice to go there. And that's a very, very important part of your film. Uh, written by Dan O'Bannon, Ronald Schusset, and directed by Ridley Scott, who we'll also see again. The B story. Um, B stories are fun, right? Uh, you need a break. You've had nothing but narrative, and you might be getting a little tired of it, kind of like you might be getting a little tired of hearing me talk, getting a little taxed by it, right? And so you need, you need a break. And the B story provides that break. Usually it's a love story. Um, and so I'll, I'll refer back to Legally Blonde that we've already talked about that because it's, it's your, not your typical love story, but it's a love story. Um, Elle's B story is with Jennifer Coolidge, the manicurist, right? That's where she goes to be nurtured, um, where she confides things that are hard and the place where she draws the strength eventually to push into act three. Um, the B story is a place to talk openly about theme. Um, often again, it's your love story. So it's a place to, to weave that back in. It's a place to give you a break from the A story, usually with some comedy, some lightheartedness, things like that. Um, in Napoleon Dynamite, it's a little different. Um, and I include it because it is different. It's not a love story, right? Um, Uncle Rico is your B story. But what he is is a con man. He's a, he's a false mentor. Um, often you can have a mentor, and that would be more of a love story. But he's a false mentor. And Napoleon doesn't fall for it, but his, uh, his brother Kip does. Right? And so throughout the film, we break into this B story, not only to laugh some more, but to kind of learn a little bit about theme. And to, uh, and to get a break from Napoleon's shenanigans. Napoleon Dynamite was written by Jared and Jerusha Hesh and directed by Jared Hesh. The next part, this is the fun part of a movie. When you're writing it, when you're watching it, the fun and games, right? The promise of the premise or the poster promise, right? You see a poster and you expect something, right? Um, you see Jaws, you expect danger with sharks. You see Die Hard, you expect guns and explosions and, and, and when you see Samuel L. Jackson, you expect some bad words, right? Um, when you see Home Alone, you expect this kid to do some crazy stuff that, man, you would have done when you were a kid if only your parents would have left you and gone to France, right? Um, he goes into his parents' room and messes around with things. He watches films he's not supposed to. He eats everything in the house that he's not supposed to, right? And, and all of that is just fun and games. And what's not happening the plot is not advancing, right? We don't see anything change significantly. The stakes are not raised for about 25 minutes. And we don't care because this is fun. This is why the idea was cool, right? This is what we came to see. And so the fun and game section is a ton of fun to write, and it's a lot of fun to watch. Home Alone, one of my favorite films, written by John Hughes, one of my favorite writers, directed by Chris Columbus, who's all right. Then we get to the midpoint. Uh, the midpoint is usually a false peak or a false collapse for the hero. Uh, it's everything the hero wants he gets, but it turns out that's not what he needed. Or everything he has is lost, but it turns out he didn't really need that to begin with. Right? Um, it's also where we're gonna raise the stakes again. We're gonna start getting back into the story and we're going to tip, uh, push it up. And uh, the fun and games are over now. Um, the match, there's a matching beat for the midpoint, just like there was a matching beat for the opening image. It's the all is lost moment that we're going to talk about in just a second. So I'll just keep that in mind. Um, if the midpoint was an up, the all is lost is down. If the midpoint was down, all is lost is an up. Um, and you'll notice we call it the all is lost. So most of the time, the midpoint is an up, the all is lost is down. Um, but in The Matrix, and Blake Snyder would want me to mention that it happens at 59 minutes in a film that's just a little over 110 uh, minutes and so it's right there. He always mentions that whenever he's right. When he's wrong, he just kind of breezes over it. But um, Neo finishes his training. He finds out he's going to be able to dodge bullets, right? Um, we also see the A and B story cross here because Carrie Ann has a special reason for wanting Neo to be the one. And uh, we also find out that Joe's a traitor here. He just wants to be sent back into the Matrix as a as a Hollywood star, and he's gonna he's gonna betray everybody. 
Um, and we also get Neo's false defeat. He visits the oracle, and the oracle tells him, you're not the one, right? The Matrix was written by Lana and Lily Wachowski, credited at the time as the Wachowski brothers, and those ladies also directed it. After the midpoint, we, whoops, no, yeah. We get into what I find usually to be the most difficult part of the writing for me. Um, the bad guys close in. It's not hard to make the bad guys close in. What's hard is to get out of it because you have to make the bad guys close in so hard that you think there's no way out. And then you have to figure it out, right? Um, and so you can't use half measures here. Things really have to fall apart. They need to have nowhere to go. It's gotta be terrible. And if it's not, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna buy into your stakes and we're not gonna be entertained by your movie. Um, it has to be hard, it has to be really, really terrible. Um, and so I use an example here from a comedy because even in a comedy, everything really goes bad. Um, in Ocean's Eleven, we have uh, Julia Roberts causing all kinds of trouble. And even if it's not associated with Ro uh, Julia Roberts, there's obstacles and conflict happening everywhere. George Clooney keeps being seen with Julia Roberts, so he's flagged by security. Carl, the older gentleman, he's, he's got some heart trouble. Um, and then uh, Don Cheadle here, uh, he's got an EMP device, and it's supposed to knock out all the power and everything else, and, and, and the safe's supposed to come out of any, and nothing happens, right? It's, it's kaput. So their plan seems to be falling apart. George Clooney can't be involved, and he's, he's the ringleader. Carl is dying, we think. And, and the EMP that was supposed to get all this kicked off, it's not working, right? So everything is against them. And um, we're kind of thinking, well, are we the suckers or is it Andy Garcia? How is this going to happen, right? And you have to be able to get your audience into that mindset. If you don't, you haven't succeeded in the bad guys close in and you need to take another look at that section. Ocean's Eleven was a uh, screenplay by Ted Griffin, the newer one. Obviously, there was a version with the Rat Pack as well. Um, and Steven Soderbergh directed it. Then we hit the all is lost moment. Um, this is, like I said, the opposite of the midpoint in terms of an up or a down. Um, it's often labeled as a false defeat, because uh, even though everything looks black, it's temporary, right? All those things that are terrible there for the Ocean's Eleven crew, something's about to go right, right? Um, you just don't know what it is yet. Um, it seems like a total defeat. The hero's life is in shambles, there's no hope. Um, and at this point, we almost always get a whiff of death, is what Snyder called it. Um, think Obi-Wan in Star Wars, right? Soft man. Um, in this case, I, I bring up Elf because, um, one, because Snyder talks about it, and I think it's very uh, apt, but also because in a film that is that funny and that lighthearted and kid-friendly, there is still a whiff of death. Um, he has just found out that his real father has rejected him. The world is too complicated for him. He just doesn't know where to do, what to do, and he, and he pauses on a city bridge, and he looks way down at the water that's below, right? Is he contemplating suicide? And, and probably not, right? I'm going to leave it up to you, but I hope not. But um, you get that whiff of death, right? Um, and this scene is eerily similar to the beginning of It's a Wonderful Life, where Jimmy Stewart is up on the bridge and very actively contemplating suicide, right? So even in comedies like Elf, you almost always get that whiff of death. And the reason that you need it is because you need to be able to fuse that first act and second act, that, that thesis and antithesis. You need to bring them together. That old world has to die in order to make room for this new world that you're going to get this synthesis in act three that's about to come. Okay. Elf, um, and there's a really interesting, I don't have time, there's a really interesting show on Netflix called uh, The Movies That Made Us or something like that. And uh, Elf is on one of those, and, and you'll learn some interesting things about that screenwriter if you watch that. David Berenbaum and, and John Favreau's in it too, and he's great. Um, John Favreau directed. So um, the all is lost moment, you get that whiff of death, and then you get the dark night of the soul. Um, this can be a five second or a five minute thing. It happens somewhere between pages 75 to 85, according to Snyder. And this is that, Lord, why hast thou forsaken me moment, right? Um, it's the point where the hero reaches way down and they have to pull out that last best idea that's going to save everyone. But at this moment, it's nowhere in sight. We don't know what it is. They don't know what it is. And, and everything has gone wrong that can. Um, this is a scene from Spike Lee's uh, Do the Right Thing. And we've got Smiley wailing, right? Um, he, he is seeing Rocket Raheem, or, uh, 
sorry, Radio Rahim being, uh, being carried out. Aussie is trying to calm everyone down. Danny Aiello, he's out there pleading, you know, I, I, I didn't call, this was, I had nothing to do with this, right? Um, and and the, the, whole, the whole town is about to tip, right? This is that moment where you need the hero to come up with that last best idea. Like I mentioned, this is a Spike Lee joint, so written and directed by Spike Lee. And then you get it, the solution, right? Your character pulls out that last, last idea and, and we break into three or we turn into three. Uh, usually, it's the love story, right? That A and B story are gonna intertwine and you're gonna get some sort of answer. The typical way is the love interest provides that last clue they needed and the hero knows now how to, van how to vanquish his victims, or vanquish his enemies, and, and win the girl. Right? That's your classic wrap up and that's how you get the answer in a lot of movies. There are a lot of different ways to get there though. Um, and in this scene from Blade Runner, Harrison Ford, uh, we do see the AB cross. He leaves Sean, As uh, Sean, uh, Sean Young. He leaves Sean Young, uh, the replicant that he's fallen in love with. And he goes back to Sebastian, the maker's apartment, and he's gonna fight the last replicants. He's gonna end this, right? He's decided he has the courage and he's gonna do it, even though they're all stronger and so on and so forth. And he runs into Daryl Hannah, the back flipping killer, right? Um, but he bests her. And then he heads off to, to fight with Rutger Hauer. Blade Runner, screenplay by Hampton Fancher and David Webb Peoples, and directed again by Ridley Scott. So then we hit our finale. Um, the finale is going to be usually about 25 pages of your script, um, from 85 to 110, uh, the end, right, until the final image. And uh, the finale is going to be your climax. It's where all those lessons that you learned are applied, and your character ticks are either mastered or that foreshadowing that's been, that's been creeping in your head comes, comes into play. Right? And um, the old world, it's turned over. There is a new world. And it's all thanks to the hero, right? The world is changed. That antithetical world of Act Two, um, the, the experiences he had there, the obstacles and the conflict that he had to overcome, that has led this character to the solution, and it's implemented, right? Um, I'm going to risk it. We only have nine minutes, but uh, I love Jurassic Park, right? Um, that's my shirt, the, the mosquito in amber here. Um, if I'm not being pretentious, it's my favorite movie that's ever made. When I saw it in theaters, um, I was, I don't know, it was mid-90s, I saw I was 15 years old. Um, there was popcorn flying whenever the, the raptor jumps up at the ceiling and things. I mean, I'd never seen anything like it, and, I, and it still holds up today, I feel like. Um, it, it was an incredible movie, and the, and the storytelling was also incredible. One of the first that really made me love movies. Um, so I'm going to take the time, and we might have to really rush, but... Um, Snyder says that there are multiple elements to a good finale. And the first is you have to gather your team. And so in Jurassic Park, there are, the team is split up all over the place. You've got Grant and the kids, and they're trying to make their way back to the visitor center. And you've got Arnold, who's out there, hopefully, at the maintenance shack trying to fix the breakers. And you've got Muldoon, um, the uh, clever girl, that guy, and Ellie, and Hammond, and Ian. They're all back at the, uh, at the bunker, right? And Ellie and Muldoon say, you know, we haven't heard from Arnold. We can't get in touch with him. Nothing's working. We're going to risk it. We're going to go out there. Uh, Muldoon grabs his, his, his shotgun or whatever, and uh, Ellie grabs the comms to keep in touch with her team. And off they go. And this is the point where, where uh, he would say, we're storming the castle. And in Jurassic Park, we're storming two castles. Grant and the kids are rushing towards the visitor center. Muldoon and Ellie are rushing towards, and Hammond and Ian in support are rushing towards the maintenance shed. Right? Um, but we run into what he calls a high tower surprise. This is where the enemy makes its last best effort to stop you, right? And so we have raptors. Um, Muldoon is gonna stay behind and face off with the raptor while Ellie makes a run for the shed. Um, and we've got this electric fence that ironically, if Ellie succeeds, could kill her love interest and the kids because they need to climb over it to get to the visitor center. The other problem is that we find out that the, uh, the raptors can open doors, right? Because um, after Ellie gets in and she, she turns on the power, we actually shock Timmy, right? He flies off the, off the fence and into Grant's arms and he's not breathing. Um, mm -hmm. High tower surprise. 
And, uh, and then we find out as Ellie is leaving the complex, we see Arnold's arm drop on her shoulder, except there's no Arnold attached, right? And then the raptor comes through. And she runs out of the maintenance shed and closes the door. Um, and we think he's contained, right? Dinosaurs don't open doors. And, and after Grant revives Timmy, they get back to the visitor center. He leaves them in the visitor center to go look for everyone else because he thinks they're safe. Because again, there's closed doors. Dinosaurs can't open doors, except they can, right? The raptors have figured it out. And so they get in there and Timmy and, uh, and uh, I can't remember her name, Lex. Uh, Timmy and Lex, they have to run into an industrial kitchen and Timmy actually ends up um, tricking one of the raptors into a freezer and, and locks them in there. And, um, and they, re, they reconnect with Grant uh, and Ellie and they, they're back in the, uh, in the control room. And that's where we get to our next moment, which is the secret weapon, the dig down, right? Um, to get past that. And, and we find out that Lex, this computer hacker, is going to be able to use that skill to bring back the power, to bring back the systems, because Ellie brought back the power. Um, and so she uh, brings back the door locks, Raptor is locked outside, and she brings back uh, the phones. And Grant calls Hammond and says, you know, the phones are working, call somebody, get the helicopter here, we need to leave, right? Um, but before he can hang up, Hammond hears gunshots. Right, because back in the control room, they're shooting through the window at the Raptor, and the Raptor breaks through the now weakened window from the gunshots, and they have to climb up into the, into the vents, and that's when you get that moment where the Raptor jumps up and everybody threw their popcorn. Um, but they aren't able to elude him. Right? They get out onto this uh, kind of rickety uh, scaffolding above the, um, what used to be here, which was a big T-Rex in sort of a similar position in a Brachiosaurus skeleton, and the Raptor is chasing them, so they fall off it, they break down the skeleton, and, uh, and, you know, things couldn't possibly get worse, except they can, because remember, Raptors open doors, so that one that got locked in the maintenance shed, he's there now, too, and they're on both sides, and this isn't going to work. They're going to be dead, right? Except suddenly we get to the final twist and the transformation, which in Jurassic Park is this T-Rex showing up and <laughs> chomping down on one of the Raptors, right? Um, very convenient, right? Uh, a little bit of a deus ex rex machina, right? Um, but you don't really notice because it's so satisfying. And there's that irony of uh, this apex predator now unwittingly helping the humans. And I mean, it's, it's a dinosaur fight, right? So you just kind of enjoy it enough that that, that convenience is washed away. Um, and then Hammond, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Grant and everyone, they, they, they go out there and Hammond and Malcolm arrive in the Jeep and Grant tells Hammond he's decided not to endorse your park. And Hammond says, you know, so have I. And so he's learned his lesson, he's learned respect. Right, we've, we've made the change through all of these things that have happened. And then we cut back in here and we get uh, what is not the final image, often associated with the final image, kind of like opening images and opening sequences. But we see the banner fall. He roars in the exact same position that the skeleton was a moment ago when dinosaurs ruled the earth, as they do now. Right? Brava. Great filmmaking. And we drive off. The final image, in case you're trying to remember, is uh, Hammond. He's He's looking back at, his, uh, at the amber on his, uh, on his cane, which reflects back to the opening image of the amber, raw amber with the mosquito in it in the, uh, in the cave or mine or whatever it was uh, at the beginning of the film. And you know, I think the actual final image is like over the ocean and these, and these prehistoric animals flying. But that, that was the drawback there. Okay? So finale and one of my favorite movies. And I made it. So uh, Michael Crichton wrote the book. Um, he also contributed on the screenplay with David Cope and then Steven Spielberg directed. And then we get our final image. Um, and I'm gonna kind of wrap things up after this real briefly, but this is, this is the end of the structure. Um, the final image calls back to the first. And so with Forrest Gump, for instance, uh, in the very first image is a, is a feather. It's floating through the air and it lands at the foot of someone we don't know yet who's sitting at a bus stop with a box of chocolates, right? And here at the end of the film, Forrest has uh, just visited the grave of his, uh, of his lover and um, he's sitting with his son at the bus stop. Forrest Jr. gets on the bus. Forrest notices a feather at his foot. It's carried off by the wind into the air and straight to you. And that's the end. The film was directed by Robert Zemeckis, written by Eric Roth. And as we wrap up, you might kind of be wondering, you know, so what do I do? Um, first thing I would say is everybody here is a great resource. Um, one of the best things about writing is having a community. Um, when I was in LA, one of the best things I could have, I, I, there were so many talented professional people to work with and trade ideas with. We'd trade scripts. I'd give feedback, they'd give feedback. You'd learn from them, they'd learn from you. Um, community is a huge part of writing, even though writing is such a solitary process. 
Um, and I, I highly recommend that you connect with others to uh, be able to share that um, experience of writing and the, the ups and downs and also for the feedback portion. Um, the next thing I would say is you need to write. Um, you know, what's your story? Everybody has one. Everybody has a unique vision and view of the world. And when they say write what you know, that's what they mean. They don't mean, you know, if you, well, they might mean that, but if, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're a garbage collector, they don't necessarily mean write about picking up cans and how it's, you have to do it with this angle, you know. That's, that's not the expertise we're looking for. They want to they wanna know about your observations of people. What do you notice about, you know, the kids that wait for you or the folks that won't put their can right where you tell them to or, you know, the guy who's driving you or your boss, you know, what are these interactions like, these relationships? What are, what are, what are people in your world like? How do you develop characters that are multidimensional, interesting, and relatable? Um, and how do you put them through hell to get them out on the other side? If you think you ever need help with that, I do offer a six-week course. Um, it's a little different than this one, less rushed. Um, <laughs> they're two-hour segments. Uh, these are kind of a breakdown of what they are. Uh, the next one's going to be in September. Um, it, is, it is a paid course, but if you are here today, um, I offer 20% off, uh, and I think it can be helpful. I'm also available for coverage. That's something I do. Uh, it's something I've done back in LA as well, and basically what that means is you give me your script and I give you pretty detailed feedback. Um, the level of which or the amount of which depends on um, what you're looking for. And again, there's my information. Uh, if you ever want to reach out with questions or anything else, I'm available. Um, I'm not available today because I am taking my wife out for Mother's Day. We're going to San Cadia, um, so I won't be able to hang around much today. I can for a couple of minutes. But um, if you have questions or you want to reach out to me for anything, I'm here at TurnFilmCo.com. If you have a great script, I like producing great scripts, so share it, um, and we can talk about that. Uh, if you just have ideas and you want to um, you know, coordinate in that way, we can, always, we can always look at that. Um, if it's an idea that I produce, there's never a charge for coverage or anything like that also. It's just part of producing. So. All right. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate you coming out this morning. Thank you. Thank you.